Well, hello, 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 everybody. This is Dr. Beth Knox, your psychology exam study buddy. And I am here today to go over uh, the issue of intelligence. That is our topic today. We are on episode 20. And you guys know that I go over the theory in one episode. I repeat myself over and over and over and explain in concepts to assist you in what? Transferring the information into uh, into your long-term memory so you could ace your psychology exam. Okay? Alrighty, so this is episode 20. Let's get started. So what is intelligence? Now, first we're going to do is uh, define intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. Intelligence is the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. As we know, in many studies, intelligence have been defined by whatever intelligence test measures. So we know that back in the day too, intelligence really was defined by what the tests say it was, what the intelligence tests measure. And that was the definition of intelligence. And the definition has evolved, okay? so. There's an evolution in regards to the thought about intelligence, and it's now defined as the ability to learn from experience, to solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. Now, please note, you probably know some people with talents in science, others who excel in humanities, and still others gifted in athletics, art, music, or dance. I mean, you know people that are just talented in different areas, not just book smarts, right? Um, you may also know a talented artist or, or somebody who is just pretty much fabulous in math or brilliant in math or, or something to that nature. All these people that you know, it's, you know, have their own type of intelligence. They are intelligent in their own ways, right? So the question would be, well, are all these people intelligent? Could you rate their intelligence on a scale or would you need several different types of scales? I mean, what do you think before I continue? Do you think you could rate uh, all of these different types of intelligence on one particular intelligent scale or test? Or do you think you're going to need different types of, uh, of scales? Of course, you're right. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're going to need different uh, types of scales. Okay. Let's talk about general intelligence for a minute. So Charles Spurman, and that's that's a name to know. There's a couple of names that you need to know on intelligence tests, okay? And Charles Spurman, S-P-E-A-R-M-A-N, is one you need to know about. He believed that we all have one general intelligence. OK, that is at the heart of all our intelligent behavior from navigating the sea to excelling in school. So he basically believed that we all have just one general type of intelligence. So let us learn the definition. General intelligence is According to Spurman, and that's the thing, you have to be able to associate some of these definitions, terms, and theories to its pioneer, 
Okay. So Sperman pioneered this concept of general intelligence. Um, he believed that um, intelligence in itself underlies all mental abilities and is therefore measured by every task on an intelligence test. So general intelligence, according to Sperman, underlies all mental abilities and is therefore measured by every task on an intelligence test. Okay? So this idea of a general mental capacity expressed by a single intelligence score was what was who in whose day who's who uh, pioneered this that's right sperman that's right sperman um please note please note um we might then liken mental abilities to physical abilities which is the ability to run fast is distinct from the eye-hand coordination required to throw a ball on a target. Yet there remains some tendency for good things to come packaged together, for running speed and throwing accuracy to correlate. So too with intelligence, several distinct Distinct abilities tend to cluster together and to correlate enough to define a general intelligent factor. Now, don't forget when we're talking about intelligence, intelligence mean the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. And general intelligence, which is according to Spearman and others, uh, but we're going to focus on Spearman right now, underlies that all mental abilities and is therefore measured by every task on an intelligence test. Now, let's move on to theories of multiple intelligences. And I want you to associate the name Howard Gardner with Gardner's multiple intelligences, of course. So Gardner, you will definitely see this name on most psychology exams when talking about intelligence. So Howard Gardner has identified eight relatively independent Dependent intelligences, including the verbal and mathematical aptitudes assessed by standardized tests. So Howard Gardner has identified eight relatively independent intelligences. So that therefore you you will hear um, terms like you know titles like Gardner's Multiple Intelligence Theory, okay? So remember that. Gardner had eight uh, different types of intelligences and also proposed a ninth, but let's stick with the eighth for now. So Gardner views these intelligence domains as multiple abilities that come in different packages. Brain damage, for example, may destroy one ability but leave others intact. And consider people with savant syndrome who have an island of brilliance but often score low on intelligence tests and may have limited or no language ability. Some can compute complicated calculations almost instantly or identify the day of the week of many given historical date or render incredible works of art or music, for example. About four in five people with savant syndrome are male. Now, I want you to 
um, click on the link below. I've got a link below about intelligence and IQ scores, and I do go more in detail about um, savant syndrome, okay? So I do have a video that talks more about this uh, savant syndrome, which is on the autism spectrum, all right? So with Gardner's, let's get back to Gardner's um, multiple intelligences. And again, in the video below, I do go in depth and describe each one of Gardner's multiple intelligences. But for this study buddy episode, you do just need to know um, that Gardner says, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. There isn't just one general you know, type of intelligence. There are eight different types of intelligences. Okay. All right. So let's move on really quickly to Robert Sternberg. Uh, and Robert Sternberg, you know, agrees with Gardner that there are more than one type of intelligence. Okay. So it's not just about, you know, traditional intelligence. There's more than one. And he came up with three. So Sternberg says there are, there are three intelligences. Gardner said eight. Sperman said one general ability. Now Sternberg is saying there's three intelligences, okay? Um, so again, Robert Sternberg agrees with Gardner that there are more than one, um, you know, Way, ways of success than traditional intelligence and that we have multiple intelligences. But Sternberg triadic theory proposed three, not eight or nine intelligences, but three. Uh, analytical would be the first one, which is academic problem solving intelligence. So Analytic is the first one proposed by Sternberg. And creative intelligence is the second, which demonstrated in innovative smarts. For example, the ability to adapt to new situations and generate novel ideas, just you know, creative intelligence, that's the second. And practical intelligence is the third. And he says practical intelligence is required for everyday tasks that may be poorly defined and may have multiple solutions. So again, the three types of intelligence proposed by Robert Sternberg, you have your analytical, which is your academic solve, uh, problem solving intelligence, okay? It is assessed by intelligence tests, which present well-defined problems having a single right answer. And such tests predict school grades reasonably well and vocational success more modestly. So Robert Sternberg proposed three types of intelligences, the first being analytical, which is the academic problem solving intelligence. Then you have your creative intelligence. And then the practical intelligence is the third one. Now, a lot of us, including myself, do believe that you know, there's there's more to it. There, there's multiple intelligences, not just one. But of course, there's always criticisms to any theory. There's always criticisms. So let's go over a little bit about some criticisms of multiple intelligence theory. Um, of course, wouldn't it be nice if the world were so fair <laughs> that a weakness in one area would be compensated by genius in another, right? Um, research using factor analysis confirms that there is a general intelligence factor. It predicts performance on various complex tasks and in various jobs. 
and extremely high cognitive ability scores predict exceptional achievements such as doctoral degrees and publications. Even so, success is not a one ingredient recipe. High intelligence may help you to get into a profession, for example, um, you know, certain schools or training programs or what have you, but it won't make you successful once there. Success is a combination of talent and grit. So those who become highly successful tend also to be um, well connected and, you know, according to research, of course, and very energetic. Okay. So it's not just one thing. There is a combination of things that, um, you know, that define success. By the way, I've got a um, video all about success and I'm going to link it in the description box below for you guys who are, who are interested in success, the different types of success and how to become successful. I've got actually a whole series, <laughs> a whole series on, on the habits of success. So I will actually link the series um, below in the description box. Okay, let's talk about emotional intelligence right now. Emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive, understand, manage, and use emotions. Emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive, understand, manage, and use emotions. So, some psychologists have further explored our social intelligence, the know-how involved in understanding social situations and managing ourselves successfully. Now, psychologist Edward Thorndike first proposed the concept, this is a na another name to remember, okay, Thorndike. Edward Thorndike first proposed the concept in intelligence. A critical part of social intelligence is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence consists of four abilities. Perceiving emotions, like recognizing them in faces, music, and stories perceiving emotions, okay? And this is where folks with autism have, have problems in perceiving emotion in faces, okay? All right, next, understanding emotions, which is predicting them and how they may change and blend. So emotional intelligence perce is perceiving emotions, understanding emotions, the third part being managing emotions, knowing how to express them in varied situations. So man being able to manage your emotions, that's part of emotional intelligence. Now the fourth is using emotions to enable or adapt adapt or create using creative thinking. So again, there's four abilities in regards to emotional intelligence. They are perceiving emotions, understanding emotions, managing emotions, and using emotions to enable adaptive or creative thinking. So now I'm going to quiz you. What are the four abilities to emotional intelligence? What's the first one? Perceiving emotions. Very good. What's the second? Understanding emotions. Good. 
What's the third? Managing emotions, right? You, you're great. And what's the fourth one? Using emotions to enable adaptive or creative thinking. Look at you. You are doing great. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right. Let us move on to assessing intelligence. What is an intelligence test and how do achievement and aptitude tests differ? So, an intelligence test assess people's mental aptitudes and compares them with those of others using numerical scores. Intelligence test, you have to know the definition of intelligence tests versus achievement tests versus aptitude tests. Intelligence tests is a method for assessing an individual's mental aptitudes and comparing them with those of others using numerical scores. Intelligence tests is a method of assessing an individual's mental aptitudes and comparing them with those of others using numerical scores. Achievement tests is a test designed to assess what a person has learned. Achievement tests is a test designed to assess what a person has learned. Aptitude tests is a test designed to predict a person's future performance. Aptitude is the capacity to learn. Aptitude test is a test designed to predict a person's future performance. So remember this, intelligence test is a method of assessing an individual's mental aptitudes and comparing them with those of others. Achievement tests is a test designed to assess what a person has learned. And aptitude tests is a test designed to predict a person's future performance. Okay, here is a name that you have got to, to know. Alfred Bernay. And it is spelled, it looks like it's Bonnet, but it's French, so it's pronounced Bonnet. So Alfred Bonnet, B-I-N-E-T. Alfred Bonnet, I want you to associate him with what we call the mental age. So let's go back a little bit. Um, modern intelligence testing traces its birth to early 20th century France where a new law required all children to attend school. French officials knew that some children, including many newcomers to Paris, would struggle and need special classes. But how could the schools make fair judgments about children's learning potential? Teachers might assess children who had little prior education as slow learners, or they might sort children into classes by their social backgrounds. To minimize such biases, and this is something that I, we definitely will go over, is the biases and IQ tests. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. But to minimize such biases, 
France Minister of Public Education gave psychologist Alfred Bonnet the task of dis, uh, designing fear tests. So Bonnet and his student Theodore Simon began by assessing, assuming rather, that all children follow the same course of intellectual development but that some develop more rapidly. A quote-unquote dull child, and yes, that's the terminology that's, that was used, a dull child should score much like a typical younger child, and a quote-unquote bright child like a typical older child. Thus, their goal became measuring each child's mental age, which is the level of performance typically associated with a certain chronological age. The average nine-year-old, then, has a mental age of nine. Children with below average mental age such as nine-year-olds who perform at the level of the typical seven-year-old, would struggle with age-appropriate schoolwork. To measure mental age, Bonnet and Simon theorized that mental aptitude, like for example, athletic aptitude is a general capacity that shows up in various ways. They tested uh, many different, many different students, and items answered correctly would deem them bright. Others who didn't answer them correctly would be deemed "quote unquote" backwards. Okay. Simon and Bonnet made no assumptions concerning why a particular child was quote-unquote slow, average, or pre precocious. Bonnet personally learned um, towards the environmental explanation. So he was more uh, leaning towards the environmental explanation of why a child would deem bright or slow. So to raise the capacities of slow scoring children, he recommended mental orthopedics that could help develop their attention span and self-discipline. He believed his intelligence tests did not measure inborn intelligence as a scale measures weight. Rather, it had a single practical purpose to identify French school children needing special attention. Bonnet hoped his tests would be used to improve children's education, but he also featured it would be used to label children and limit their opportunities. So again, he hoped that his tests would be used to improve children's education, but he also feared at the same time that it would be used to label children and limit their opportunities. So let's review, let's review some of these definitions again. Mental age. So mental age is a measure of intelligence tests devised by whom? Who came up with the mental age? Do you remember? What is his name? That's right, Bonnet, Alfred Bonnet. So mental age is a measure of intelligence tests performance devised by Bonnet. The level of performance typically associated with children of a certain what? Chronological age. Thus, a child who does well as an average eight-year-old 
is said to have a mental age of eight. That's right. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's move on. There are other tests. For example, the Sanford Bonnet test is a widely used American version by Thurman at Stanford University of Bernays' original uh, intelligence tests. Okay, so you will hear um, tests such as the Sanford Bonnet tests and the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale tests. Let's go over the Sanford Bonnet. So Lewis Thurman, uh, measuring innate intelligence. That was his thing, okay? So Bonnet's fears were realized soon after his death in 2011. Do you remember what Bonnet's fear was? We just spoke of it. He hoped that his tests would be used to improve children's education, but he also feared something. What was that fear? That's right, you remembered. He feared it would be used to label children and limit their opportunities. So Bonnet's fears were realized soon after his death. And he, when did he die? In 1911. When others adapted his tests for use as a numerical measure of inherited intelligence. Now, remember, you know, everybody's not wonderful and fabulous like you who wants to give everybody an opportunity. <laughs> okay. Remember when we went over the whole nature versus nurture uh, debate and controversy? Nature referred to what? genetic and biological influences, okay? So everything to do with one's gen genes and genetic makeup, that is nature. So proponents of nature would say, well, this person is, you know, who they are because of, the, of their genes and you can't change that. But the nurture perspective and nurture, as we know, you know, starts off in the womb, Nurture perspective is environmental influences that make up who this person is. So nature is genetic and nurture is environmental. So you had some people in the ruling class of a certain time period that believed, you know, that, you know, the, this, peop, the, this person or these people are who they are based on genetics. It's their nature and you can't change that. So some people did believe that and they did use these intelligence tests to try to prove their point. So Lewis Thurman uh, tried the Paris development questions and age norms um, with California school children. But the French norms didn't work with California kids. Adapting some of Bonnet's original items, adding others, and establishing quote-unquote new age norms, Thurman extended the upper end of the test range from teenagers to superior adults. He also gave his revision a name. Today's version retains that same name, which is the Stanford Bonnet. Now, some, from such tests, German psychologist William Stern derived the famous term intelligence quotient or IQ, which is what we use a lot. So the IQ was simple, uh, simply a person's mental age divided by chronological age and multiplied by a hundred to rid of the decimal point, okay? To get rid of that decimal point that was in the other, the other test. Thus, an average age child, for example, an average age child whose mental and chronological ages are the same, an IQ, this child would have an IQ of 100. But an eight-year-old who 
answers questions as would a typical 10 year old would have an IQ of 125. Okay, so let's review this a little bit more. So we talked about mental age, a measure of intelligence test performed, uh, test performance uh, devised by Binet, okay? Alfred Binet. The Sanford Binet, the widely used American version by Thurman at Stanford University of Binet's original intelligence test. And intelligence quotient, the IQ, defined originally as the ratio of mental age to chronological age multiplied by a hundred. On contemporary intelligence tests, the average performance for a given age is assessed in score of 100. Okay, let's move on to the Wessler Adult Intelligence Scale. So the WAIS, as it's called, okay, that's the acronym for Wessler's Adult um, Intelligence Scale, right? And its companion versions for children are the most widely used intelligence tests. You got to know this, it's on the quiz, okay? They contain verbal and performance, which is nonverbal subtests. So psychologist David Weschler created what is now the most widely used individual intelligence tests. And together with a version for school-aged children, it's called the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children, and other and another one for preschool children. So he there's different age levels. Okay, the latest, um, which is a 2008 edition of the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, consists of. 15 subtests, including these, like, for example, similarities, uh, reasoning the commonality of two objects or concepts, vocabulary, naming pictured objects or defining words, block design, visual abstract processing, letter number, sequencing on hearing a series of numbers and letters, repeating the numbers in ascending order, and then the letters in alphabetical order. The This particular test, the WAIS, yields not only an overall intelligence score, as does the Sanford Binet, but also individual scores for verbal comprehension, uh, perceptual organization, work in memory, and processing speed. Striking differences among these individual scores can provide clues to cognitive strengths or weaknesses. Okay. Now, standardization is defining uniform testing procedures and meaningful scores by comparing and the performance of a pre-tested group. So we're talking about principles of test construction right now and standardization is something is a word to know a term to know it is defining uniform testing procedures and meaningful scores by comparison with the performance of a pre-tested group 
If we construct a graph of test takers' scores, the scores typically form a bell-shaped pattern called the bell curve or normal curve. This, I could tell you, is definitely on my um, psych exams, okay? So you got to know that the normal curve, the definition of a normal curve is the bell-shaped curve that describes the distribution of many physical and psychological attributes. Most scores fall near the average and fewer and fewer scores lie near the extremes. And again, I've got the video link below to one of my learning video lectures all about IQ scores. And you will see, um, you know, the different pictures of the bell-shaped curve and, and the meaning of the numbers and so forth. And one thing you have to remember is that about 68% of people score within 15 points of 100. So most of the population fall, in regards to IQ scores fall between 85 and 115 with the average IQ score being 100. You have to remember that, okay? So no matter what uh, attributes we, we measure, like height, weight, or mental aptitude, the curve's highest point, so the curve on a bell-shaped curve, its highest point is the average score. On an intelligence test, we give this average score a value of 100. Moving out from the average towards either extreme. Okay, so you have the uh, the bell-shaped curve and right in the middle, right in the center is 100. Now moving outward from the center, okay, in regards to the um, scores, it moves in 15-point intervals, okay? Moving out from the average, towards either extreme, we find fewer and fewer people. For both the Sanford Binet and Weschler tests, a person's score indicates whether that person's percentage, no, whether that person's performance fell above or below the average. A performance higher than all but 2.5 percent of all scores earn an intelligence score of 130. A performance below that uh, a performance below than 97.5 percent of all scores earns an intelligence score of 70. What does this mean? Again, we said the average IQ score range. The average IQ score is 100, but the average range is 85 to 115. And you have scores that start from 130 or above is called your gifted and talented people. So scores 130 or above, uh, which is only 2.5% of all scores, 130 or above, these are your gifted and talented genius or above superior uh, in intellect levels, okay? Now, scores that fall at 70 or below, 70 or below, these are folks with intellectual disability, and there's different names for that. It, uh, it used to be called mental retardation, 70 or below, but we now know that this word, we do not use this word anymore. We use the newer term that is not, you know, um, so passe per se, that, you know, we use intellectual disabled person or people with intellectual disabilities or something to that nature, but we, we no longer use the term intellectual uh, mental retardation, okay? Okay, so let's move on to the term reliability. 
Reliability is the extent to which a test yields consistent results as assessed by consistency of scores on two halves of the test, on alternative forms of the test, or on retesting. So knowing where you stand in comparison to a standardization group still won't say much about your intelligence unless the test has reliability. Now, a reliable test gives consistent scores, no matter who takes the test or when they take it. Okay, so a reliable test gives consistent scores, no matter who takes the test or when they take it. So that is something you need to know. Now, validity. Validity is the extent to which a test measures or predicts what it is supposed to. Validity is the extent to which a test measures or predicts what it is supposed to. High reliability does not ensure a test validity. The extent to which the test actually measures or predicts what it promises. Okay? All right. Um, let us move on. Okay, now in regards to the dynamics of intelligence, I need you to know the difference between crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence, okay? So crystallized intelligence is our accumulated knowledge and verbal skills, and it tends to increase with age. So crystallized intelligence is our accumulated knowledge and verbal skills, and it tends to increase with age. Fluid intelligence is our ability to reason speedily and abstractly. Now, Got to know the difference, okay? With fluid intelligence, it's, it tends to decrease with age, especially during late adulthood. Okay, so, so the answers to our age and intelligence questions depends on what we assess and how we assess it. Crystallized intelligence, which is again, our accumulated knowledge as reflected in vocabulary, um, different vocabulary tests, increases up to old age. Fluid intelligence, which is our ability to reason speedily and abstractly, as when solving novel logic problems, decreases beginning in the 20s and 30s. Can you believe that? It used to be they used to say, over 40, you're over the hill, and that's when your cognition decreases. But newer research suggests that it actually starts in your 20s and 30s. Oh my goodness. So with fluid intelligence, it decreases beginning in the 20s and 30s, slowly up to age 75 or so, uh, then more rapidly, especially after age 85. Now, in regards to the issue of bias, the scientific meaning of bias hinges on a test validity, on whether it predicts future behavior only for some groups of test takers. Now, 
We can also consider a test bias if it detects not only innate differences of intelligence, but also performance differences caused by cultural experiences. Learn more about biases in my video below regarding intelligence and IQ tests. Well, we are all set, everybody. This is Dr. Bev Knox. Once again, your psychology exam study buddy. Don't forget to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Listen to this over and over and over. I want the information that we went over to leave your short-term memory and go into your long-term memory and stay there because you are going to ace your psychology exam. Okay, everybody, I will see you in the next episode where I actually go over questions and answers from real psychology exam. See you then.